Hello, everyone, and welcome to another Disclosure in the Media. I'm here with uh, Ryan Polkarts again, and, oh. and we are discussing uh, more of the spiritual beliefs of the Elder Scrolls. Uh, you may have seen in the previous episode where we discussed uh, the, uh, the term called the mantling, the Kim, and, and the zero sum, and these other concepts, which I find very fascinating, how they sync up to things we already uh, speak about. And they basically the ascendance to godhood within the Elder Scrolls uh, series. So, uh, Ryan, take it away. So, the last time we looked at Kim and how it um, is achievable by the characters in this universe, if they can get this knowledge that they're part of a dream, but then have the ability to say, I am still a valid being. Like I am still real, even though they've just been shown all the evidence as to like, kind of to contrary that. It's like the ultimate ego almost. It's like, it, but it's not like a negative ego. It's just an ego that says, even though like I'm part of this thing that's, I have no control over, I do exist. Mm -hmm. Um, Whereas, like, negative ego would just be like, I have the right to be over you. Whereas this is more just like, I exist. So I don't view that as negative ego, per se. Um, yeah, so there's that, a fine line between confidence and, and negative ego. And that is more like in the, this is in the positive uh, ego side. Yeah. Yeah. And um, then because you've achieved Kim, you can kind of shape reality to your own will. Not all the time, but in ways that aid you, make you more powerful. Um, and that's how Kim works. Now, someone who's cheap Kim can then take it to the next step called Amaranth, where they look into like the deeper metaphysics of the universe and kind of then come to the realization that they themselves can become a dreamer and step outside, like adjacent to the dream that they were born into and then become a new dreamer of their own universe. And then like can kind of, bring things from the old universe into this new universe, but it's really convoluted. And today we're going to talk about the beginning of the dream that is the Elder Scrolls, um, as opposed to the process of becoming this Amar the new Amaranth, which is like the dreamer that, and I'll explain why Vivek never done it, never did it because he kind of saw it as like, just kind of staying it off the inevitable. Um, so basically I'm going to start with some pictures because they kind of are the only thing that I can use to explain this properly. Um, so is it showing that like zoom panel in the middle of the screen? Uh, no, it's show just showing your, uh, the graphic where it says it's, on okay. your pathway and, uh, Godhead and, and Godhead on the side, it's showing the graphics. So yeah. Yeah. Like zooms control thing just popped up in the middle. So I just want to make sure. So okay. this would be sort of the, the entirety of the dream in, in like a wheel form. If you were able to get outside the dream, this is kind of how you'd see the dream, even though you wouldn't be able to like see it this way but they say like if you got outside it would be like a wheel even though the godhead is it's is like a being that's like unconsciously dreaming this they don't really have like a, a will for it it's an unconscious dream and then like the whole like alduin eats the world is like alduin is the end of the the dream and then a new dream the next kalpo would come up from there um in fact parts of yokuda like Yukutan uh, early Red Guard mythology and how it like collapsed, mm -hmm. say that it was like a leftover thing from the last dream, and that it was Anu's. Well, because technically Anu or um, Amaranth or the Dreamer is technically kind of the same being. It's weird how they explain it. Also, I have a better picture for it up ahead, um, but that's like their memory of Yokuda from their world. And that um, the next like continent over Akavir is like the next dream. And that's what they know of the next dream. Mm -hmm. But we don't know if that's actually like the truth. We just know that that's like, that's a theory that Yokuda and Akavir are like separated that way for that reason. Um, it could just be, natural tectonics and stuff but that is a theory that yokuda 
and the fact of it and it's intri- it's like weirdness and the same thing with that is like it's how the dreamer recognized these places from their own reality and like the realities that they know about though it's all subject like this is like people argue about this kind of stuff on forums it's like that kind of stuff. There's never going to be written stuff about the dreamer really in the games other than one character that talks about it. And that's Vivek and Vivek, as we know, is kind of a special case. <laughs> hmm. um, so then if you're looking at this thing more linearly, you'll, you can see it like this. So Anu, the dreamer or Amaranth or just the dreamer, I'm just going to use the dreamer because it's easier to differentiate between Anu and Padme here, the mm-hmm. second level. So, before anything was in the dream, Anu and Padme were in the dream. Anu first, which is like stasis and order, Padme, which was change. Um, and they basically warred over like just creation. And, and then it's stated that they kind of created their own uh, souls and became Anuliao and Sithis. And their battle then Basically, they killed... Well, Anu and Padme basically killed each other and then created Anu and Sithis to continue. The blood from their conflict created the At-Ata. But when Anuliel became around, it, it created Akko, which is the, like the theory of time. So mm-hmm. to get into that, that would be like this, where Ariel is... Akka is the same being as Anuliel. And then Ariel... Uh, Elkosh, Akatosh, and Alduin are like the pieces of that whole. Like like the, the chosen expressions of that period. Okay. Okay. Um, this is actually making sense where we, uh, Joanna and I spoke about something called the map of creation, where we we showed that the uh, that source creator created celestials, which then uh, created the different different nature and the, and, the, and the different genders eventually of people as they went down further further down. And the oversouls of people fell under this category. They couldn't evolve more until they figured things out within their own multiversal avatars. And also the end of time type of uh, situation like Alduin, it's like in the Marvel Cinematic Universe, if anybody's ever seen the movie Eternals, where Ashram is kind of like Alduin in it, where he's a celestial that comes back to give birth to another celestial off the basically the back of humanity consuming that energy. Now they mixed uh, they mixed draconian Lushing along with you know uh, essentially the universe re- rebuilding and basically giving birth to itself. But this uh, I find fascinating that it is essentially the. Uh, uh, the same as what we have been talking about all along like, like on Galactic and Stellar Council, me and Joanna have been speaking about how it's the physics also, not only the oversoul, but the, uh, but um, how can I put it, uh, the continuation of what the, what you, what's called the next egg in Skyrim, where, where uh, Parthenax basically tells you, uh, oh, well, you deny the next egg existing, and then you basically say, oh, the next egg can tend to itself. Well, I think there's some, there's a little bit of BS in there because uh, there's a bit of the whole Lushing story, like there's always going to be an apocalyptic end, kind of like in Witcher, where it's the white frost, you know, uh, where essentially they were basically saying like an ice age would consume everything. There's always this, this uh, doom of apocalypse. And I always feel that um, life will continue anyway, and there's no need for an apocalyptic uh, end such as that. There's always going to be a continuous evolution regardless. I think there's like an air of BS in there because of the end of, of like say Nirn or the end of uh, end of the Earth to create something else, uh, the universe tends to itself in that way. It doesn't necessarily need to consume a whole civilization. But I didn't mean to interrupt. But that's basically what I was getting from that. Oh, you're all good. Um, so yeah, that the whole Alduin eating the world to create the next world, like open up this like space for the dreamer to make another dream. That could be true. But then again, there's another whole apocalypse situation which is just everything ceases to exist like that if the dreamer wakes up. Mm-hmm. And also the dreamer, uh, uh, you know, when we had uh, beings like, say, Frank Fred Zeta and uh, Jeremy Brett come through, they're saying that uh, they were also saying, yes, you can dream a whole universe into existence, a whole, uh, a whole uh, 
world into existence when you can go ret you return to your oversoul and access the totality of your library, bringing the codes and codexes from here, there, you can literally create whole worlds and whole universes and dream things into existence. But at the same time, uh, you can have another way of life end or a way of uh, being in or like a myopic way of being in and turning into uh, changing your perspectives and perceptions and therefore mantling, as we said before, infusing with the best aspects of your oversoul and your avatar. This is what happened with those two people when they passed on. And they're saying, yeah, the destruction of Earth and the apocalypse wasn't necessarily necessary. They could literally create a whole other universe where it had a certain uh, dream, a whole other universe into be, or a whole other planet into be. So yes, that, that fits the basis of the of the dreamer. Uh, I could see how they would say, you know, get rid of nerd, and then they could dream another world into existence. But literally, you could dream a whole other set of timelines into existence on that same note. All right, so back to this. Now that I've gotten the whole time situation out of the way, because basically, when Anuliel became like a thing. Mm -hmm. time exists like linear time began to exist in this period before that linear time didn't exist you go backwards and forwards at will so, uh, and then dragons are their own sort of situation because so Anulio makes Akka Sithis makes Elkan which then turns into Lorcan, and Shazar and Shore which are kind of all parts of this right which we talk about Lorcan being the over of these two, even though they kind of are all part of this whole side. Anuliel creates Akko, which is time, the way we talked about it, and then these different branches off of it, where Alduin is kind of a branch, more connected to the Dove and the Jills, which I think the Jills are just like dragons that aren't in form. Mm. Um, they're very rarely spoken about. And then Akatosh and Ariel are the other aspects underneath that other Akka form. Um, then together, when these two are, f when these two killed each other, the blood created the Atada, and when Akka came into being and the linear time existed, they were able to take form. They go on to become Magnus and the Magnagi, the, like the early spirits, as well as the Daedra, and then also the Aedra. So Akatosh mixing with these Atada create the Aedra, um, and then it goes down to the earth bones, the wheels, the Elnafe, which is what every thing, like, once you hit Elnafe, that's like all the primordial races is like ancestors, like the normal races, ancestors. And it just leads. So like the wandering Elnafe turns into men, the old Elnafe turned into elves. Beast folk are sort of, it's weird. Beast folk, some come from elven stock in like most traditions like eventually that have been like turned changed by the earth itself so like realistically you could say like the earth bones and the Eldmer came together to create beast folk but also like just elnofe that mixed like straight elnofe that mixed with Eldmer also came became made beast folk essentially they're like uh, essentially elementals yeah until yeah kind of um the argonians are different because of their whole thing with the hist uh, we know that they do fall into the Elnofe, but I think they're Elnofe that like subjugated themselves to the Hist and the Hist being like this weird other thing don't really fall onto this greatly. And I have a way to bring them in later, but with another thing, but uh, yeah, so this is kind of just a deeper version of this where this is more the um, dimensions mm -hmm. and this is more like the actual like descended thing. Okay, one's like um, the family tree and the other one is essentially the map of creation. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, so the, the way that the Aedra are in here purple and the Daedra, they're actually equals. They just show them lower because the Aedra are the ancestors of this group. Not, and the Daedra kind of just end their line there. Okay. Yeah, um, and then, what's, what's interesting is the split when they went from the Anu dreamer, which would be very much almost like like source, you know, because the word uh, Anu in Sumerian mythology means uh, sky god or above. So, and like Anunnaki, those who from the heavens came. This is not only the map of some of like the Anunnaki lines, but if you go to the map of creation with the creator council, that then began to create the different different uh, subsections of creation, such as like stasis change. But then you also have the void dimension where, where we spoke last time, where demons are trapped within this like unsolvable 
uh, uh, dimension. This is where people summon demons from when they, they always say bringing them across the void. This is essentially Sithis, but it's also uh, uh, very similar to a god named Mithras, which he is the god of contracts, uh, essentially deals and bargains. And uh, with, with that, uh, where he is essentially in, uh, essentially supposed to be in control of what deals are made from beings from the void. So there you can see a parallel that, that works there. And he also has other little subsections too, ex exactly like how Lorca and Chizar and Shore are. There's a, the, and uh, Lekan. Uh, there is a, there there is a branch off of that where there's other versions of self. Even uh, even um, Enlil even branched off and had Jesus attached to him in that way. Essentially, a better fragment of the whole of Enlil. Enlil had essentially corrupted from a vampiric contagion, which was also again from the void. So uh, you had that, but they had, he had a branch off of him that became what well, we know as Jesus, but still it wasn't exactly the same. The story, I won't go into that. It doesn't really apply here, but just know the branch off portion of that story does indeed apply to both the void and the dreamer. And uh, Lorcan, when basically tricked the Adra into creating a, the Mundus plane, and then as they realized their power is getting sapped, they became the, a lot of them fled and joined this and became, went to Aetherius and that's Magnus and the Magna Gi. Meridia got thrown out of Aetherius for something. And then be, she basically kind of like joined the Daedric princess. She just carved out her own realm of oblivion. Um, but back with Mundus, Lorcan gets ripped apart and becomes like part of the world with the heart of Lorcan situation. Mm -hmm. Um, it's and like had that now has these like aspect people that come in as like Lorcan's agents kind of thing, more just agents of change and like growth for the world. Um, and then the Adra be the ones that stuck around became the divines. Um, then that's kind of this whole thing explained. I mean, the dreamer here kind of is unaware of all of this. Mm -hmm. like oh, they, yeah, they, the other aspects of it that basically branched off, but they have their own thing, kind of like we branched off from sorts, you know, and we do our own thing, but we still are all connected to the the one source. And also, it's interesting that, that the beings from the void, like Lorcan and, and aspects of Sithis, are actually driving uh, aspects of change. It's interesting they put change on that side of the dive because... Um, uh, like with the whole Shiva concept here where destruction was a, a, it would look like total destruction and he's the, basically the god of destruction but it's actually a form of change destroying one way and bringing about the birth of another uh, granted again you don't have to have it be apocalyptic it's more change within the self destruction and an old way of being and bringing out more uh, the better perceptions and perspectives within yourself and that's essentially also fusing together with uh, the Oversoul, which is the mantling, like what we were talking about. So uh, uh, some of these bad guys that I've encountered in my own personal life have also not only driven me to know more about them, I'm not giving them more credit than credit is due. They, they don't even know what they are totally involved in. Just like the dreamer doesn't know about all these other aspects. The bad guys from the void don't always know. And some of the other, uh, uh, you know, basically agents of chaos don't know exactly what they're involved in. They, but it ends up overall driving you towards not only learning about this, but bettering yourself in the process in some of these situations through, through learning about, uh, through a whole set of lessons about some of these bad guys. Yes, there's overage that go outside of all these things, kind of like all these, uh, like, say Meridia exiting, uh, uh, exiting like she did. Uh, you know, there's a lot of these other beings that have also exited from this that cause bits of overage that don't always apply to the said uh, lesson curriculum type of uh, scenario. So that's hard for some people to believe. Everybody thinks it's all a part of the entirety of the plan, and that's not necessarily true. Um, you have some that are, that work as a fine oiled machine, and you have these agents of chaos that go outside of that whole chain, the, the destruction and then change and rebirth type of thing. They just poke in here and start poking holes in the entire system. So you, you do have, uh, you have chaos involved as well. And personally, I think dragonborns are like mixtures of these two energies coming together. Mm -hmm. like yeah. That. Yeah. Cause they usually lead to change, but they also generally make sure that the world doesn't fall apart. So 
Mm -hmm. kind of the mixture of these two energies just coming together. Yeah, it's just like uh, when you go to just basically destroy Alduin, like I said, Parthenus asks you if you would deny the next egg existence and and the dragonborn essentially says, let the next egg tend to itself. So yes, that is a balance between both sides, a change and and rebirth and also the defense of the current world. So that is essentially the same. That's I, I, I feel people are a mix of both of these to begin with. Uh, humans themselves are a mix of, of both of these these uh, concepts into one. And eventually we're going to get rid of that dualistic like seed that this shows right here. And we're going to basically uh, realize we are a combination of all of these concepts. Here's just another like wheel and spoke model of it where like you have the Godhead above, which is the dreamer. Just another word for it. There's many words for the, the dreamer, basically. Um, and then you can just see Sithis on one side, Anuliel on the other. The wheel and the tower is sort of this like thing kind of keeping the rest in. It's like viewing it from the way Anuliel and Sithis would be looking inward. Um, and then this Aetherius is just that realm of magic that's outside the world where like magic energy comes from. Magnus is the hole that goes down through Oblivion and carries magic into Mundus, basically. And then, then you have just the realms that we know. All right. Yeah, I can see how the different realms of Oblivion would be basically like negative, like what I call negative zero points, where they essentially are blockages to, uh, to accessing the greater understanding of, of creation. Like, say, for instance, you have a realm of Oblivion that is essentially some of these holographic realms, like I explained in the Oblivion episode, people can go back and listen to that. But say if those those realms were blocking access or at least partially blocking access because people aren't allowed to completely circle the toilet forever and be completely trapped. Say they are blocking some of these, the access to the outer universe and multiverse uh, where people can gain information. Therefore going inward would be the best, best result. This is why they try to divide people from within. You can also see those those realms, those holographic realms, as like how you see them like spheres around Mundus. That's essentially going back to uh, a, uh, I believe it was called a Aristotelian worldview, whereas people believe they would the the, the uh, accessing the spheres would be the points to going to heaven. That's essentially the soul trap of uh, uh, a philosophy where these uh, these fake heavens attempt to draw you in and attempt to siphon off of your energy and you're trapped for eternity in there and you think you're in a heaven. This is essentially also what that is saying because a lot of these Daedric Lords uh, try to get you contractually into uh, into those realms of oblivion. You can even say Sovereign Guard is part of that too if you want to get kind of technical because not only as you said, Shore is an aspect of, of Lorcan, but he's, uh, he's also created Sovereign Guard where all the Nord people go when they die, very much like a Valhalla. Uh, and uh, like Odin said in a past show, he said that shore, uh, them creating shore like that was essentially a slap in the face to himself uh, in, uh, in history, where I'm surprised I actually remember that. Uh, but, uh, but yeah, this is essentially how some of these mechanical spheres are set up to where you have uh, what people call the white light. And it's actually a data stream that goes to an AI sphere that creates this realm within that's not completely the the like the realm of oblivion because like a realm of oblivion would be essentially a holographic layer that these the, the, the this is like a point where they can access now can other soul traders hack into that data stream yes and they do and they, they will g- grab ghosts out of the walls of the tunnel and take them back to their planet where they can incarnate them there that's the soul trade uh, and also, uh, also there's energy harvesting, and you've heard me talk about that at length in uh, other times. But this uh, this whole setup, how you're showing uh, these these spheres blocking the greater understanding of the Godhead, uh, is actually quite interesting. And Anu also being the Godhead, that's also essentially like um, uh, essentially Odin in, in Norse mythology. He's the All Father, or eventually he uh, further back he was called Anu. Now, do I think he's the Godhead? No, but that's how people have viewed him throughout uh, out history. He has been considered to be the All Father, and eventually, some people linked him up to Almighty Father. That would be like the Christian God, or you have Enlil being Yahweh in the 
Old Testament, his son. So this, uh, this I find very interesting where they've linked the two things. Also, if you look at the movie um, Doctor Strange, where he, um, where he encounters Dormammu at the end of the movie. Dormammu, I believe, translates to God, uh, uh, like, like uh, overall father God, or like, uh, like all father from ancient Sumeria. You've heard, you've heard the term Mamu, like big Mamu, that's mother, and then you know, Dormammu is father. So uh, essentially, they were essentially saying father God is evil, and uh, essentially somebody's Hollywood take on that because Hollywood is Luciferian and satanic. But uh, of course they would say an all father God would be dark. But at the same time, you have like the different spheres and then uh, you reuniting with the, the one. That's like the board collective in Star Trek where they basically say, you know, um, you know, simulate uh, uh, resistance is futile. They all uh, link them into the one. Somebody is attempting to say the concept of one is dark. Uh, and I know that took a big rabbit hole where I uh, where I went uh, that whole path, but there uh, this is um, the point I'm trying to make is they've inserted some things in there that you combine things with other things that don't necessarily go together, and uh, the people are hoping through word and visual association they're hoping that uh, that you'll you'll see that. But overall, what we've explained is essentially good. It's just uh, essentially the map of creation. Uh, and I may even add the whole discussion me and Joanna had on the map of creation onto this video when I can actually locate it. But um, I, I'll add that in because this, this encompasses so much of, uh, of uh, this discussion uh, right now. This whole map actually makes sense. And the blockages to, to the greater creation, which would be like the realms of oblivion, exactly like what is taking place now. I know that uh, some people are probably gonna have to back that up and see what I uh, what I just said. Uh, but uh, aside from adding all the multiversal information, omniversal, things of that nature, uh, this actually makes a lot of sense. Now, if you add in all of these other things, you have all these other universes and you have the multiverse, then you have the, uh, aside from that, you have the omniverse, which is a set of multiverses, and you have a super omniverse, which is a set of, of omniversal expressions or states. Then you have those, those overlords, essentially, that run those omniversal and super omniversal expressions. One could argue that would be like the realms of oblivion, but the realms of oblivion in this case would just fall under the, uh, the center space, how, the, how you're showing it here, and the omniversal expressions would be further out from even from this godhead map uh but true benevolent source creator or neutral creator would encompass all of uh all of the omniversal and super omniversal expressions well, the, godhead, uh, the godhead does technically encompass this it's just not like conscious of it yeah okay like the the, the whole godhead is not completely Conscious of all the aspects and all the little. Oh, it there. doesn't even know it created said this and Anu. Ah, okay. It, oh, it, that makes sense. It's yeah. it's like it's like when you have a dream and you just don't remember the dream. Mm. Okay. That's why it's aspect of the dreamer. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. That's why when you achieve Kim, it's kind of like becoming a lucid dreamer, where like you can control the dream because you are like know you're in it. Okay. Oh yeah. Okay. That that's a that's a that makes a lot of sense because. Uh, this also applies to planets as well as creator. It's really odd, like there's this weird lag time. So this applies to the dreamer concept, whereas this applies to the earth too. Like if I find a corrupted bit of land, let's just say, um, and I can perform an audit, I'm asking not only benevolent elementals to help out, but I'm asking the benevolent earth mother to help out. And it's like the, the earth mother didn't know she had an itch that she had to scratch, essentially. It's like she was in that almost like that dreamer state herself or creation didn't realize that a part of itself was schizophrenic or a part of itself had se almost separated from itself and created other uh, distortions of itself. Uh, that's essentially the same uh, concept, but lucid dreaming, it would bring about order to chaos. This is, uh, 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 it's interesting how somebody would achieve that, that Kim and then create a whole, whole universe and dream that whole universe into existence. Like, like I said, uh, performing that mantling and actually uh, uh, actually uh, achieving this. Now, if you want to find a very good example of the mantling, uh, look no more than the series Picard, 
at the, at the very end. Sorry, this is a spoiler. The character of Wesley Crusher in it. Uh, he goes with a group of travelers that you eventually find out are uh, essentially trying to keep balance and order to the universe. It's not the same as the dreamer, mind you, but he achieves um, mantling because the first thing he says, he goes, I was once called Wesley Crusher. Now that I'm, I'm more than this, he's essentially fused with the entirety of the his greater self. And I find, I found that very interesting uh, that we saw that episode after the same night that you and I recorded the previous episode mm -hmm. to this. So I, I find that very, very, very interesting. But the whole concept of Dreamer is exactly what, what Jeremy Brett and Frank Frazetta were telling us in their channelings, whereas they could literally dream a whole, whole universe into existence. And I, so I find that interesting that the Dreamer encompasses all of these concepts, but yet doesn't always know that a lot of this, a lot of this is going on, like Frank Rosetta and uh, Jeremy Brett both said that they didn't see all aspects of the outer parts of their creation because it took new life in other areas that they couldn't always see. I find that very fascinating that that applies to this. And uh, to further this, now that I have a good thing, we're just going to go off topic for a couple seconds here and talk about some of the other things you're seeing on this. Mm -hmm. So if you don't in life pledge yourself to a daedric prince your afterlife is more in a in this sort of pocket here where you see sovereign garden the sands behind the stars which i believe is um red guard afterlife it's in the dream sleeve basically it's in an area of the dream that's kind of outside the dream while being in the dream mm, okay um these little dots are the actual stars, the holes that were torn by the Magni Ghi as they fled Mundus. Oblivion here is not perfect because Oblivion is kind of a collection of outer dimensions that aren't perfectly wrapped around the world like that, but, they're, but they are like encompassed by Aetherius. But they don't, it's more like they are, you, your version of a holographic reality is a good way to say it. Like they're, they're, you wouldn't see it if you were down here but they do encompass the space between these two. Mm -hmm. But to the person looking up, that space between these two is not visual. Um, the little parts... Uh, so a great, another good example of mantling within the Elder Scrolls lore is the whole Sheogoreth at the end of Oblivion thing where you break Sheogoreth and Jiglag back apart Shiagorath then becomes, you mantle Shiagorath, your character from Oblivion mantle Shiagorath becomes the new Shiagorath, the one that you play at, that you meet in Skyrim. Mm -hmm. And Jigalag is free to do what Jigalag does again, which is basically correct, basically be the agent of Anu, of Order Stasis within Oblivion that then will like undo a lot of the problems that the Daedric Princess create. Ah, okay, okay. Um, then... But, so that's my little tangent there. Uh, as for the wheel in the tower, again, this is like a, a tech concept I don't really have the most knowledge on. Um, the battle spire and the soul cairn down here, they're pocket dimensions within Oblivion, so they usually fall uh, either under the sphere of a Daedric Prince, even though they're not directly in that Daedric Prince's main hold, or they could be independent realms within Oblivion. They're just so they're small pocket areas like the soul cairn that you visit in skyrim is technically part of oblivion but it's controlled by the idol masters which are a bunch of just mages who turned themselves into crystals and then became uh like the, the masters of this realm mm. they are high level necromancers uh and they kind of just carved out this little like a uh, little bit of oblivion the battle spire is this weird thing it's commonly known to be under the sphere of um Mayroon's Dagon, but that's only because he invaded it during the events of the game, and we kind of don't know too, too much else about it. But what we do know before that was that the Imperial Mages Academy was, like, training battle mages there. <laughs> so it may have been another one of these realms that was, like, carved out by mortals in Oblivion and then was uh, invaded by a Daedric Prince and taken over by a Daedric Prince. And so, yeah. Um, on to the next thing. We're, I'm going to just talk about this whole Anu thing, just try to give you a bit more um, 
context. So Anno is neither Adra nor Adedra. He precedes the creation of both groups and played a part in their creation with his counterpart, Padme. In the annotated Anod, it is stated that Anno and Pad- Padme came into being. They both engaged in combat over Nier, who was created for their interplay. Basically, like a, a dimension that they created to just be part of. And birthed the 12 worlds of creation. Anu and Padme fought over Nier, who died in the process. That's old world. Died in the process and then created Nern out of the remainder of the 12 worlds. Padme and Anu already thought dead. Padme, who Anu already thought dead, stabbed him through the chest, resulting in Anu pulling himself and Padme out of time forever. That's why they're like adjacent in the that those like things. Okay. According to the account, the Arara were created when Anu and Padme's blood was spilled. Their mixed blood spontaneously gave birth to the Adro, while Anu's blood became the Magna Gi, and Padme's blood would end up giving birth to the Daedra. However, the authenticity of this clash is still debated. Basically, though, they're this, the, the blood basically created their the gods that we remember. Um, the whole, like, which blood made what thing is the, the thing that's a bit more debatable um in Aldmeri belief anu birthed his own soul after being after his battle with padme so that he could understand himself and self-reflect this reborn soul known as anuliel and in turn became the soul of all things however as anu created anuliel padme birthed his own soul sithis who represented all of limit all of the limitations of anuliel anuliel then noticed that the world created in their conflict, the Arubis was turbulent and chaotic. In order to stabilize the Arubis and further his self-reflection, Anuliel birthed his own soul in the same way that Anu before him birthed Anuliel. Anuliel's soul was known as Ariel and began a new force known as time. Time allowed the realm of Arubis to realize its nat- natures and limitations, and thus the Adada born from the blood finally be able to began to take form like certain daedric princes without akka creating like the time the linear time thing Mm -hmm. and the cause and effect relationship um couldn't exist most notably azura couldn't exist without that like time like basically coming into existence time cause and effect coming into existence because she is just an agent of cause and effect Oh, I see that. I see the relationship there. Yeah. But time is essentially a distortion of, of creation and also an invention of mankind, but also we needed to be able to, to kind of ground and perceive uh, things as they are. You know, it can be a trap in and of itself. Uh, t- I can see how they would have had to create Akka the time in order to create the whole cause and effect because you wouldn't be able to in any sort of either void or, or uh, other situation you wouldn't be able to have a cause and effect. Even within some of these other realms, negative or positive, there's still a perception of cause to effect. Our brains decode the perception of cause to effect. Like if we were to go to one of these holographic realms that are in the way there, we were to go there, we would still perceive as an environment uh, from going one place to the other place and perception of a, a cycle we're in. So yeah, so will, I can see how the creation of Akka would have been necessary to bring about even that perception. Now, and the cool thing is, is that time in the Elder Scrolls is experienced linearly, but um, the Daedra, um, the, in their own realms, they can kind of control time to be their own thing, but they can't just not have time. So they're still bound by that Anu Aka time thing, but they're not bound by the um, by like the way that it's set out on Mundus. Okay. Yeah, you know what this what's interesting is also in the end of uh, Doctor Strange, what he actually does, you know, when you also have the Infinity Stones that are in the Marvel Cinematic Universe that represent some of these different aspects of two, and one of them is the Stone of Time. At the end, when he goes to Dormammu, it's supposed to be an aspect uh, uh, like, a, like a pocket realm that uh, has no time. Uh, you know, you're all fused to one in a state of non-time, but in a negative way, not in the true state of non-time, which is creativity and passion, where you just time melts away. But uh, he introduces time and puts him in a loop, and that's how he traps him. So how he traps Dormammu. So I find it interesting that creating the cause to effect and the loop 
actually helped defeat a bad guy that was not used to that, that method creation. It was actually created before that whole Akka uh, situation was created. So that, that I find very fascinating, the parallels between some of the Marvel Cinematic Universe and some of what we teach people and also the Elder Scrolls universe. All right, so now here's another really interesting um, thing. Basically, it's how we get everything. Uh, so Arubis is the name of the dream. Basically, it's not the dreamer. It's just the dream is how we're going to. I'm still going to just call it the dream, though. Um, so you can see that the dream then spawned Anu and Padme, and then they create the Atata together. Mundus is here. The eight divines kind of come out of the Adro, which come out of Anu and Padme and the like it comes out of it you see and then it comes down um then you have the divines this is like tacked on because we really don't know where he falls in okay um the Elnafe which are like those first human elf spirits and and also like the earth um master and secunda basically were more of Lorcan's kind of like creation things of his own like the moons. Um, Nern again was like, because um, he tricked the Lorcan tricked the Adra into creating it. So it's kind of got this own thing. Now on the sit on this side, we have the Daedric princes and their whole realm realms, uh, but they don't really spawn anything. They change things but they don't spawn anything but you see here with sithis it basically creates the dimension in the void the hist kind of have their other version of themselves that can then peer into by like spreading their seeds into both oblivion and nun and mundus and the hist then change the argonians to make them like their mortal agents under here, you have the whole, the Adra, and then you follow the line and to the Elnafe, which this is kind of wrong, really. It should go Elnafe straight to lines of men and lines of merge. You go uh, wandering Elnafe and then um, old Elnafe. Old Elnafe should then turn into Eldmer. Eldmer should then lead to Khajiit and all the elves which the Khajiit and all the elves thing is basically Azura, the Daedric Prince, uh, kind of like mated with these Elnafe and turned them into Khajiit. Or their offspring came, became Khajiit. Um, whereas the wandering Elnafe, the ones that joined Lorcan in this early battle um, that is kind of conjecture, uh, became the races that would then become men. Yeah, what I find interesting also is the relationship also with the uh, Aster and Seg uh, Segunda and the Hist. It's very interesting where this is, this is uh, the, those two moons are of Lorcan, and you have one that is the appearance of our moon and Mars. Uh, you have like uh, essentially war and chaos, essentially, which is what Mars is associated with. But essentially, uh, Mars and the old wars had its atmosphere ripped off by those that actually created the grand illusion. So uh, uh, also the lunar moon uh, is like our own moon, which then also uh, uh, projects uh, hologra uh, holographic imagery through that of the binary network, through that of our 5G network. Uh, there's also the red, the red moon there could also be considered almost like Saturn without its rings. And that is essentially a, a soul trap or a trick. So Lorcan is like Loki, essentially. The Hist, uh, uh, so uh, the Hist, what I find interesting there is, uh, as well, Saturn, Satan, Loki on the other end. Then you have the Hist, which is almost like the tree of knowledge. Here's, a, here's something that links it right back to the actual void. This goes with the story of Odin pulling out his eye and giving it to the Well of Ud. The Well of Ud is the entry point to the, to the void in actuality, meaning someone giving their soul to the void. Now, did the real Odin do this? No, that was a fake Odin that wanted to bird this, this tree. The tree then of knowledge then uh, was more or less uh, Yardzadril was, uh, was essentially the map 
of how Asgard, Midgard, and Agartha are set up now along with the Nine Realms. You have portals that lead to these different worlds of, excuse me, these different worlds of creation. Whereas after Asgard exploded, uh, what happened is I found out it went interdimensional. It has its interdimensional physical self the way it was before it exploded. It's literally here with us now. So is the spirit world. It's all here with us now. There are portals that could literally condition you and take it, you take you to these different realms like Hyperborea as an access point to Asgard. And the tree is essentially the whole map of the nine realms, but it also is in the, the acts uh, within this very story of itself is an access to the void. And the well of Ud is essentially the void. It's, it's grown essentially from the void, but at the same time, it is uh, supposed to be like the access to all of that knowledge information universally. But on the flip side of the coin, one could also say it is the unsolvable unsol riddle because the well of Ud is essentially the void. So uh, like what I said with the tower and the, uh, and the unsolvable Ru uh, Rubik's cube, like I said in the previous episode, this, this, I find very interesting how this is all connecting back into it, essentially itself. Um, you know, you even have, you know, Al have uh, the, the, uh, the story in that new Hellboy movie where he goes to the uh, Baba Yaga and she wants his eye in exchange for information. That's essentially the same thing. The eye represents the window of the soul. Essentially, you're giving your soul over to the void at that point. So this, uh, this I, I find interesting how that how that works itself how it works itself out mixed in with uh, even the mythology and mixed in with actually the true map of creation. I know that was a mouthful for everybody listening to that, but that's how my brain operates. I see the entire thing play out. Uh, the fact that they disclosed that through this game series is quite quite fascinating. How when somebody looks upon this, they can actually access the. Uh, the downloads they may think it's imagination coming through but this is a, this is essentially the map of how things are even the breakdown of different races and species as you were describing is, is exactly the same as how some of these different species broke down in their own evolution Lyran being uh, or Kaji in this being related to elves and uh, the whole breakdown of that is actually the way a lot of these different species said their histories went too yeah i found a more updated picture of it while you were talking <clears throat> And when you get down here, it, it even brings in some other aspects like the Numidium and how the Dwemer were, yeah, were, yeah. All, were a cutoff of the Eldmer that then went off and then they kind of became one with the Numidium when they disappeared. And then they zero-summed because they realized that they were part of this dream and their analytical minds could not really like, fathom the idea of the fact that they are still like a valid being. And so they willed themselves out of creation. Um, with and then here it fixes the Elnafe thing where it talks about certain Elnafe that were important and viewed as heroes in the past, and then it talks about how different group like the Eldmer broke made the Altmer, which are the High Elves, came about from the Eldmer and the students of Finaster, the children of Yafir, which are the nature spirits, and the and the Altmer made the Bosmer. How the Falmer were created from the snow elves degenerating and that the snow elves were just a local offshoot of Eldmer that changed over time. How the Maromar are the same with the sea elves, that the Orzmir are, are were Eldmer slash high elves that were corrupted by the Daedra and same thing with the dark elves. Um, but the Khajiit, you have the same thing where it branches off and then you have them and children of Zura. Um, dragons are their own thing, which are like an offshoot of Akatosh, which is an offshoot of Anu. Um, you have, uh, what else can I talk? Oh, the Tribunal, which were mortals that then used divine tools to basically turn themselves into immortals, and thus basically breaking these chains off of them and allowing them to become their own thing. That's how Vivek, one of the ways that Vivek like, grew into this being that then could achieve Kim and then could then achieve what came the closest that we know of to becoming a a new dreamer hmm. um i find that i find that also interesting that also anu uh you have enki and enlil which is essentially what parthenex and alduin essentially are supposed to be uh essentially uh, uh enlil being like alduin 
and then uh, Enki being uh, Parthenax. So they put them all as dragons in, in the storyline, but it's essentially telling the same story of that family tree as well. Now, that's why I go back to the Anunnaki lineages as well. It's telling some of that story mixed in with the map of creation as well. It's physically fusing those together. And then this one also does a better job of showing that Anu and Padme were their own things first, and that Sivis came out of, and Anuel came out of them. Mm-hmm. Whereas this one basically forgets to mention Padme at all, and, and also Anuliel as their own things. Um, so yeah, that's basically that. We Then again, we have back to this picture. And then this is going to explain why Vivek did not become a dreamer. Mm-hmm. Um, it's basically that Vivek had a love for the Dunmer that w- basically made him realize that if he becomes a dreamer and takes the Dunmer out of the world so that they can grow, he's basically only staying off, like, like he's just making it easier for them to then achieve this next rank, uh, to become the same thing as that what he became, and he would have wasted the opportunity to do something actually great with his dream where he would have just basically used his dream to get other people to dream. Mm-hmm. And he also kind of viewed it as like, he didn't really see a point because he thinks that all beings should have to achieve Kim themselves before they can get to the point where they could do it. Mm-hmm. Basically, he was going to like to do it. His dream would have been like everyone awakes with Kim. Okay, I see what you're saying. You know, also he was basically kind of almost wanting to lead by example, where he was ahead of the curve, and he just like, okay, now everybody has to accomplish this to get to this point. Yeah, I yeah, see. and like he himself was like Vivek being able to like detach himself in that weird way that he does, realized how what he would have done didn't matter, so he just didn't do it. Um, that's kind of I was reading this when me and Chris started talking when he called me and. Uh, I was like, wow, um, basically Vivek decided not to create his own universe because he knows what he would do with it and just decided it wasn't worth it. Yeah, oh, the, I find that interesting where he backs off from that going, nah, I'm weighing the pros and cons. It's not exactly worth cr- uh, creating what I want to create because it would disrupt this whole process. People have to get to that stage first. Now, this could also uh, signify, you know, some people believe that you're supposed to wait to ascend I, I use that term well uh, uh, not uh, use that term lightly but uh some people uh, feel that you're supposed to wait on other people and i and i fervently disagree with that if you're in your own state of evolution uh you know and you're doing your own inner work keep doing it regardless of where some of the other people are so this will then change the energies around you and actually uh actually spark their uh their mantling process as well uh, whereas these energies uh, have like a butterfly fly effect where it can change something somewhere that you're not counting on. Um, well, some people, some religious groups even believe, we even found some of like the Jehovah's Witnesses groups and everything believe that you're supposed uh, none of, uh, most of you aren't going to heaven. You have to remain as ghosts, only like some, some get to go. And I, I find that, uh, that ridiculous. You know, you all go to you know, the spirit world and go back to your your oversoul. We even found some ghosts that were here before we even knew that that philosophy. We found some ghosts on the property one time that were of like a Jehovah's Witness group, and they were actually here. To, uh, they were they were actually here disrupting some of my own energies, and we had to get rid of them. And then we found out that that was the belief system where they felt they had to hold back, and only a few were worthy. It was in the worthy, not worthy uh, type of part in the feather yeah. philosophy and our Ten Commandments type of philosophy where you're never going to achieve all of them. You know, it's an insurmountable paradox, a set of tasks. But uh, that aside, I find it I find it fascinating that uh, all this is uh, this is coming about even as, you know, these t- shows are being filmed. They're coinciding with other things that we have been discussing and they're co- uh, synchronistically coinciding with other shows we're watching too. So it's the same message that's that's coming across, across the, the board. Uh, synchronistically trying to give us more information about the map of creation and how this process uh, works and the dreamer works essentially. And the fact that it was in the games already, and uh, even though they didn't put it in the actual lore, they're hinting more at it. That's actually synchronistic in and of itself because they're getting people to figure it out as, as, uh, as time goes on and other people are adding to this 
which then shows that that philosophy is growing and, and, uh, and people are eventually going to hit that same mantled state. But the whole key of this is also don't wait on anybody else to hit that stage. You just keep going regardless of where people are in their own evolution. So, uh, and also keep your circle tight. You know, we uh, Owen brought forth the, uh, the, um, the uh, phrase, a tighter circle, deeper roots. You do not want uh, people around you that are going to disrupt that path or distract you from the lane that you are in, essentially. Uh, you want those around you that don't disrupt that energy and vice versa, you don't want to disrupt them. Now, one point I will also make is, say if you do help somebody, say if you get rid of a demon for somebody like an external demon, the new age community likes to say, oh, you're disrupting their karma. That's not necessarily true. You were at that particular place at that particular time to fix that, uh, fix that particular a bit of uh, energetics so that they could move on. And some things are actually uh, overdues, like I said before, and holding people in a holding pattern. Uh, sometimes it takes an external source to break the holding pattern. Sometimes it's not part of lesson at all. Sometimes it's this out, outward, outside mutation from that that has to be gotten rid of. And that's a generally what people help uh, hire me to do. I get rid of some of these overage bits. If I saw that it was disrupting other people's actual paths, I, I wouldn't actually do it. But in this case, it's not. It's like also in the game Kingdoms of Amalur, where you become the faint, fateless one and you go in and start disrupting all the other threads of fate and you make it so people become more sovereign. I, I actually find that a fascinating philosophy too. Maybe that's another game for another time we can do at some point. But, uh, but this, is, uh, this is the point where I will see if there's anybody here to talk about this. I have, I, I've, I've been sensing energetics. I haven't actually seen anybody. I'm going to see if... Um, okay... I do sense uh, more of an elemental energy here. It's more of a um, elven type uh, energy. I'm trying to see elven or who is this? I'm sensing a whole group here. Um, I know the forest people are, are aiming this direction, but it's not them that will speak. It's somebody else. Um, wow. Isaac, who's here? Uh, I can hardly see them. Their energetics are so fast moving that they're hard to see. Uh, and I hard to distinguish from the background here. That's the point. Oh, that's the point of it. They uh, they don't always want to be um, noticed. Okay, are you a group of elementals? Yes, you are. Okay, can we? Uh, can I see you, please? Are you an elven race? Are you elemental in in your own way? Okay, I see you. Uh, what group of elves are you? Are you from uh, the Greenland group? Are you from the uh, the, the uh, Oak group, Pleiadian types, uh, Tuathan? What what group are you? Uh, okay, you oh well, you're more you fall more under fairy than you do uh, than you do uh, elf. I know you're essentially kind of the same, but uh, essentially, the, oh, okay, what's being shown is there's the different offshoots and the different races that came from what you were talking about before. It falls under that category uh, where they, they, certain genomes combine to create different other, other fairies. Okay, you are a fairy. What manner of fairy are you? Are you a Lucy? Are you, um, are you, uh, uh, a type of nymph, what, what exactly, what race do you fall under? Uh, interesting. You are a combination, oh, so, okay. This goes with some species that we've been working with on Interstellar Council, where some are combinations of different elements where they form sentient life after a while. All right, what combination of elements are you, friend? Your earth and water, okay. What's, what's your name? Yeah, your name, I, I can see you're female now. You look almost like tree bark. Uh, has like the texture of a tree, but a like almost like a human woman that has the texture of a tree with like leaves that come around the edges from the hair and all this stuff. So, so uh, okay, I need to, one more time, I need to see your hard space, please. <laughs> oh, damn it, okay. All right, uh, so uh, you, uh, you accept an audit from True Benevolent Source Creator, True Benevolent Earth Mother, and the True Benevolent Verses, and uh, have no conflicting uh, agendas, benevolent-wise. 
Yes, and you do not have any conflicting agents. All right, all right, we're good. What's your name? Uh, this is a new person, so let's see. Huh? Uh, your name is. Is it with a Z? An X? Okay. Um, no, Isaac, your name is not Xerox. Okay. All right, let's see. Um, oh, meaning, oh, meaning she copied from a dip, dip. Okay, I know what you're saying. All right. Um, uh, z uh, is it, oh, man, that is hard to hear. Z is it z z zit, Zitter? 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 With an X? It's X apostrophe and something. Let me see here. Wow, that is hard to hear. Zitter. 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 Okay. Man, that is an odd name for a, a fairy, but okay. Um, uh, all right. Are you inhabiting a tree or are you your own being? Are you a dryad for a tree? You're your own being, but you can disguise yourself as a tree. Yes. Okay. What is it you wanted to say about this, this topic? Uh, I can bring you through, but um, what, uh, what did you want to focus on as part of the topic? All right. You might as well say, okay. Okay, wow. You know, a strong being uh, kind of brings like almost like how a tree uh, brings oxygen to a room and kind of takes your carbon, carbon dioxide uh, and you have like fresh air or if you have your, an ozone machine going off in your house and you come back and there's like a fresh atmosphere in there. Uh, this is how she feels. So it's like that. Uh, so, uh, whew. Oh, wow. And she even on her spine has like this branchy looking like spine that looks like a tree. Uh, yeah, it's very interesting. So, um, man, there's a lot of interference there. That's hard to hear. All right. Um, okay. Zatir? Zatir? I'm hoping I'm saying that right. I'm probably butchering it. Okay. All right. Uh, yes, I know, Isaac. I'm butchering the name. I understand. All right. All right. Uh, it's X uh, apostrophe T E R. Yeah, okay. The terror. Okay. Getting messed with something awful. Huh? Getting messed with something awful. I know, I can see that. Uh, Isaac, what's going on? Uh, can you help correct this while I bring this being in? Or is it uh, beings that are opposing this conversation that we should be leery of? Um, Oh, I see the point of this conversation. I get it. I get it. Okay. Are you saying that this being, Isaac, is more or less, um, how can I put it, more or less branched off of, is this more like a void being that is actually fused to like a weird inverted version of the elements? Okay, so this was more of a lesson rather than a channel. Got it? Okay, what's okay? Is this being doing the attacking? But I, but I already, I, I went through the whole heart space with her. Is this okay? You're actually teaching me at the moment. There is an inverted version of that detection method. So, meaning they can pass all the tests, but it is literally an inverted heart or an inverted uh, like. Uh, okay. uh, Huh? Like a sock. Yeah, yeah. Essentially, uh, in, inside out sock. Essentially, yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. Um, okay. Is it, okay. Then Isaac, can this being be taken out with the normal means? Yes. Okay. <laughs> All right. Oh my whole like face and head. I got like real lightheaded while you were talking there. Mm hmm. My nail, my nose started like really itching, like like a really bad allergy, like day. Yeah, like how you would with like. I was like, I like going like this, like I just couldn't stop. It was like up, sort of in the nasal cavity there. It was so itchy. Yeah, stuff. I know my nose. Uh, this is why. Uh, this is why I was doing this during the show. My the gland in my face was getting set off. That's an actual detection method if something isn't quite right. But 
the fact that it, it passed all the other tests is worrisome because, uh, uh, but my intuition was telling me, hey, something isn't right here. That's why I kept questioning the beat. So it was like, uh, uh, so Isaac, uh, were you wanting to say something on this? Why, how, why did this inverted version of this count towards this conversation? Um, it's because uh, not only was it a distraction. Oh, you want to say, okay. You, I trust. So, okay. Uh, so, okay, here we are. Yes, this is important towards this topic because of the fact that, yes, there are these mutations from nature, these overages, these, these blights on nature that are inverted and more connected to the void. Uh, think like uh, Heart of Lorcan, think, uh, think Sithus sort of uh, creature that can indeed be of almost like nature, but can then be encompassed by the void, some can bleed over through to that and be corrupted completely, very much like how some of your elementals can be corrupted by nuclear energy and look like almost like wet gnomes or wet elementals. They are being inverted by the nuclear isotope. Think the same kind of thing for the void in this, uh, this instance. This now this being has been sent back there. All he had to do is cut its head off and burn it like he normally does. Uh, this, uh, I needed him to figure this particular part out, utilizing the intuition, uh, and also the body reacts, stomach, face, nose, like what happened with yourself, um, reacts long before you ever figure out what it is you're dealing with the intuition and the bodily reactions are actually ahead of the curve versus being the, uh, being the Johnny come lately alarm clock, like he likes to call it. The mind is actually trying to figure it out whereas the body and the soul and the intuition already has. Uh, this, is, uh, this is essentially ahead of that curve. You have been absolutely correct in your assertions of uh, the, this map of creation. One thing that was not mentioned, though, is the creator council that sprang forth from the original uh, celestial type of uh, uh, type of uh, beings before there were even separate genders. This is where the soulmate concept comes into being, whereas they are separated almost like taffy from each other. But this also applies to the Earth experiment as well as uh, the oversoul dialing itself down into the various, as he likes to say, the electrical plant versus substation versus house, which is oversoul, uh, distortion from oversoul, human. And this is uh, where this uh, particular uh, philosophy comes in. The reason that I allowed this being to come in was show that there is an inverted uh, area still where even elementals can be drawn into, uh, as he would say, the well of Ood, essentially encompassing the whole uh, Yargs of Rill philosophy. This particular being was not as named as, as she said. They will always lie, but at the same time, they actually enjoy that aspect of lying, just like how there are negative nymphs that just draw sexual energy. This particular being would have drawn off of the, um, uh, some of the, not only the electrolytes in your body, vitamins and minerals, very much like the vampiric uh, plant entity uh, uh, or the uh, Venus flytrap type. But this would have also caused uh, an inversion of not only sexual capability, but an inversion of thoughts, an inversion of, uh, of philosophy itself. The, the, it's polar, uh, polarized opposite. That's why, why this being is such a distortion, you see, from the philosophies that you're saying, because it is the antithesis of this is essentially a walking distorted paradox uh, in nature, but not in nature. Uh, created from nature, but not at the same time, a walking paradox, you see. This is why this philosophy had to be added in because these are things that are outside, but still have been generated by the void that have created their own, um, he calls them fissures or bubbles, you see. Fairies don't fall into this category. This would be like the anti-fairy or the anti-nature, uh, uh, anti-elemental but still technically is, uh, or like a vampire is undead. Uh, essentially, they are dead, but not. This is essentially the same concept. So I can go into questions if you like. 
All right. Well, welcome back, Isaac. Um, so today's topic was a bit more of the metaphysics, not less of like the whole just game sort of story. Um, and with that being said, do you believe that the, the process by which a character consciously does this in-game in life can be done by mortals here in life? Most certainly, yes, and it has been accomplished before by human beings, uh, whereas they have reached that mantle state and they have become of a lucid dreamer. Uh, yes, you can dream also other universes into existence. You can even dream walk like what was in your Doctor Strange series into other universes as well and uh, begin to manipulate those other universes, which would cause, as they like to say in the movie series, an incursion. This is actually quite... Um, I have to say is unfortunately a common thing. That's a bleed through, through the multiverse. But that aside, yes, you can actually become a dreamer in the true sense in the game series where literally you could dream your own reality, pocket reality, planet, universe, multiverse, omniverse, and super omniverse into being as you stair step it back up the scale as some humans would see it. It is actually all more encompassing, like your map of creation that you saw there, both the, uh, the seeming hierarchical and the, uh, the, the round versions. Uh, this is actually quite uh, accurate. And it, would it be, so in The Elder Scrolls, the dreamer is non-conscious of the dream. Would in our, if we go by that logic here would the dreamer for us be source but source is a, a conscious like part of it yes you can actually say uh, say this uh, essentially just all distortions therein uh, this is why uh, why a lot of things are allowed in history like some of the atrocities because source is more neutral but then you also have the dreaming aspect of it where where you're having a dreamer that's both having a nightmare and a fantasy and a good dream all at the same time. The idea is for people here to essentially help creation expand beyond where it is to where creation itself is essentially then the lucid dreamer, you say. All right. So that makes sense. And so is that why when we like invoke source to like ensure revocations are done and whatnot, uh, they tend to get done because in that moment, Source is like aware of your part in the dream and then takes part in the dream enough to ensure that that part of the dream happens the way that the, it's basically Kim without, but like using Source as, as like a backbone. Yes, you can say since you are already Source, yes, you are essentially using that, that all encompassing energy, more of a rarefied, purified version of a balanced version of it to achieve that Kim, yes. Okay, um, that makes sense. Um, with the whole uh, argument over humans. So when we become dreamers, though, are we bound then still within Source's dream or do we sidestep it out and become a source for the next dream? You can. Uh, this is an actually very interesting philosophy, even though you are essentially Source, everything is essentially Source. Neutral, good, bad, ugly, all in between. This is why it's good to call on true benevolent source creator if you're wanting that outside energy, even though you do carry it all. The uh, the uh, you can become your own dream outside of this. This would fall under omniversal expression and fall under super omniversal expression, even though there is an all encompassing source energy. The one you are talking about is essentially through the uh, the multiverse and your universe. In say the universe the the Orions came through, which essentially was a parallel universe, the distorted, mutated version of yourselves and the Asgardians from that universe. That part in distortion of source, true source, was essentially trying to be canceled out by that of the dreamer. This is why they escaped from there, essentially. Uh, inviting vampiric essences or, or barging into with their vampiric essences into this expression, therefore bringing about a vampiric virus into the system. Very much like in your Matrix movies where they said other versions, older versions of the Matrix uh, ha, uh, had been created. 
Um, that's why when uh, when the female uh, character had two vampires with her, those were essentially other reboots of the Matrix that she had uh, programs uh, held with her there. Yeah, this is essentially what that is. You can either keep old uh, versions of it and reboot something new, or or just like in the fourth one, you can completely obliterate parts of it and create a whole new uh, new system. Essentially, what the, the psychiatrist character was doing in that uh, in that particular movie. Now, when it comes to you uh, achieving this uh, this Kim or achieving the mantling, yes, you can choose to create whatever you want, but also then true source then learns from that experience. But can you stay separate from that? Yes, you can, if you've achieved that particular, uh, that particular level, you can create a whole self-sustaining omniverse or super omniverse based from that seed, yes. But you can't sever your connection with source? Not completely, no, until that particular omniversal expression is then created, but still there is all encompassing energy that flows through everything that you would call chi, but it doesn't mean the consciousness that of what you call source creator at the moment would be involved. It is more or less this, this overarching energy. It is okay. still a lifeline or an umbilical cord. Yes. All right. And then, so if like in that reality, then you're the source to whatever being would then come to live in that reality. Yes. Indeed, yes, that would be correct. You would be essentially the overlord, as he says, or the god of that particular uh, omniversal expression, yes. Okay. I'm just clearing that up because it didn't... I was trying to figure out how, like, you could become a dreamer, but then what your relationship would be with this dream, basically. Yes, so uh, and that essentially that's why you have that map of creation the way that it is set up. That is essentially accurate, even though again there's an over encompassing source energy, and there, uh, there really is no God as you truly see it. It's as essentially it is the dreamer uh, connected to connected through an over encompassing energy that binds all things, essentially like the force in Star Wars. Then you have those beings if you if people look in the books those beings that were essentially from outside the force, that is actually a very, very good example of how other omniversal and universal expressions that can be outside of that particular source platform. So does source have a source? Hmm? So does source have a source? Yes, indeed it does. You see what you see of as, uh, as a source as like almost like a separate being from yourself, that is more of a distortion. Even though you are a source, that, uh, that whole source does have this over encompassing energy that is true source. Uh, what you're seeing is more of like a distortion or a uh, photocopy of this. The dark versions of it are more of a photocopy. The rest is more of this over encompassing energy, but the source that you're talking about does indeed have a source, yes. But is this like the same sort of like religious view that was like kind of talked about in the past where like source is, was once something that worshiped another source? You can see it that way, yes. In the map of creation, when there was just the over and company source and created these distortions, within those distortions created other dreamers that then became that distortion within the source, you see. Okay. And, then, and then, therefore, you could say a, a, a source worshiped source. Okay, that makes sense. All right. Well, Isaac, it, again, as always, it has been lovely to hear the sound of your voice and have you answer these questions. As you've already been on the show multiple times, I'm not going to ask the average, an the average final question, but I'll ask you a different question that has to do with if you were playing through these games. And uh, in the current moment, if you were to play these games, do you play a mage, a warrior, a thief? W what kind of class would you play? Hmm. This is actually quite interesting. I think I would have to go the thief route or pirate type route, you see, because uh, that seemed to be something that was outside of what would be a societal norm, as it were, or societal uh, uh, type of uh, acceptance. 
Pirates are always considered to be criminals. Thieves are essentially criminals, but there's also a, uh, a freedom that goes along with this. You see, the early pirates were actually resistors of more of the reptilian aristocracy. you see. Uh, this is why you have the skull and crossbones. They were protecting some of the true history. Some of them, not all of them. But in this respect, I think I would have to go the thief route because of more of the uh, sovereign freedom that goes with it, even though there are a lot of ethical arguments involved. Okay, thank you for your time. Yes, thank you. Always good to see you both. Yeah. There was a rea slight reaction to hit my eye when not stop running the whole time. Yeah. But uh, that's really odd, like some of the beings that are moving at a faster frequency, my, my, my uh, left eye keeps reacting to it, um, which is more prophetic towards this, this argument, because this eye mines my dominant eye, and that's the one that was affected during the secret space program that allowed the soul transfer was, was this eye. Mm. So I find that interesting that even in the SSP, they still go with the whole eye window of the soul philosophy to do the transferring into another body too. So uh, it still goes along with that distortion of this map of creation. Essentially they're distorting natural law by, by doing this, but still existing within it, which I find it, it interesting. It goes with the same philosophy. So, and Isaac's giving me the thumbs up there. Yeah, it's saying that. So, uh, distortion indeed, he says, <laughs> of that of time and of, uh, of, of, you know, warping natural law. Yeah, I get it. Okay. Uh, uh, so, um, I don't know if you have anything else to add, uh, Ryan, but we can take it out from this point. No, I think that was, we covered it about as well as we could cover this topic, which is, I just wanted to build on what we started the last time where it's a bit more metaphysical concepts, but. Uh, also because we left a little bit of stuff that I found after the fact that I just didn't really kind of fully understand at that point. Mm -hmm. so. Oh yeah, that, that's actually interesting. Uh, I'll probably make, make that the part one and this the part two, since at the time of this uh, this recording, it's uh, 7 6 uh, I haven't edited the previous one yet, so I will add all this together, and I will try to locate the Map of Creation episode that me and Joanna did for a talk of uh, uh, me and Joanna for Patreon. I'll add that in with, with this, since it applies to the entirety of the topic. Other stuff will be on our subscription that have to do with the multiverse. I have a whole conversation that I've done on the multiverse of madness. So uh, uh, having dreams about the different aspects of the multiverse and how they affect us and how, and how we affect them is actually accurate. If you go see Dr. Strange in the multiverse of madness is actually accurate the way they were showing it. So uh, with that said, uh, thank you everybody for watching this episode of Disclosure in the Media. Uh, I thoroughly enjoyed this episode. So uh, thank you everybody. Hope you did too. Bye-bye now. Have a good one. Hi everyone. This is again, Chris and Joanna. And uh, we're gonna just do another chat with us. The thing we want to bring up and talk about today is more of an enhancement to some of the information that's currently on uh, Patreon, which has to do with our galactic origins. Uh, I, um, so we want to, as we refine the information a little bit more, we'd like to just go ahead and get it down in a recording and go ahead and share it with our Patreon folks. What will what our goal is is to really get um, a set of classes a, going. A, a set of classes, or to understand some of these, you know, concepts that we believe are our origins, in as an in general. Now, the one thing I I do always want to state is that I think uh, our true understanding of how things are made up and what's going on, we will not understand. Uh, we will touch the surface. We will um, get a broad, generalized understanding, but will all of the information will be 1,000% factual with no deviations? I don't actually believe that because I think the, the information and how things were formed and our understanding of quantum and how everything can be one now and how all of that works, I don't think is going to be completely within our grasp at this point in our personal evolution. Um, but I think we can give a general enough beginning idea to um, be helpful in uh, getting some sort of understanding in your mind that will help you in general. The goal is always to 
empower people with knowledge. Knowledge is power. It's the greatest power there is. And then understand a little bit more of who you are and how, you know, we are co-creative beings and uh, how we're to utilize this in our growth at this current present moment. So with that, you know, one of the lingering questions that uh, of, of many that we wanted to get a better handle of is the um, origins of this expression, who was involved in things like that. So <clears throat> I will say that um, the terminology that we're going to use and how we're going to present it. The first thing probably to say is there is no separation from source. Mm -hmm. Okay. So there is a perceived separation because you are a separate consciousness, let's say. So if you want to see yourself as a consciousness um, part of source, Maybe that's a way to say it because you are your own conscious self driving your own conscious experience, but you're not outside of source. You're just kind of in source as a, you know, as your separate consciousness. Um, but again, not really at least separated, but having an experience of that, let's say. Mm -hmm. So the one interesting thing that we think is going on is you have different when when you're a, you know become a uh, consciousness within source, okay, uh, your own consciousness within source. You know, then that trickles down into ma many different layers, and so there are many. Mm, I don't know the best way to say that. I don't know if you would say lineage paths. I'm not sure exactly what you would say, but not everything is identical. Okay, the way the way I, I'll, I'll say that. So, for example, there are you know part of the learning expression of growing and learning is when you get to the point where you can start co-creating yourself um, and experience and expression, something like that. So, uh, when do you potentially get to that level, and what kind of uh, uh, consciousness are you? It seems to be that there are different consciousness types of groups, okay? One of them being celestials, okay? So celestials are a type of group that when a, a um, consciousness becomes its own consciousness, it actually falls into the area of your experience is going to be that of a celestial. Okay, and there are other ones. Uh, I don't know them all, but I just need to make a point that we're going to talk about this expression. And so we're going to talk about the examples that we understand in this expression. Not every expression has the same type of beings and or the same type of experience. But in, so we're going to stick with what little we know here. So consciousness expression, um, you know, again, still a part of source celestial. So what does that mean? Well, that means the stars, the planets, the you know, universes, the things like that. And so you need to think of um, new consciousness already potentially uh, involved in one family uh, area called a celestial. So the beings that were a part of the development of this expression were those. So celestials are the ones who try to put this expression, experiential expression together. The one we're in now. The one that we're in now. Okay. Again, other ones, other beings had something to do with. So in general, when a new consciousness of a celestial comes into being, um, you know, again, it's already always a part of source, but now it's its own consciousness. You have to think of it as source just poofed in there. Let's say there it is. So it's not like it was born of anything other than source because it's not. It's a part of source. However, there is going to, there are going to be uh, beings that actually become a part of, of let's be saying being parentish 
okay, I guess that's the good word, parentish to these new consciousness and show them the ropes, do whatever learning, but it doesn't necessarily mean that it is going to be, you know, a father or a mother. And part of that is because at that consciousness level, there is no separation yet of a male and a female. So the, the, the um, celestials that are at kind of that part of the, you know, experience, they are not male or female. They just are. Okay. And so when a new consciousness emerges, it's being, let's say parented, parentish by multiple beings that just are. Okay, they're not male or female, they just are. So in this sense, you can almost think of it as being great galaxies, you know, or where a, uh, where a um, you know, a celestial is really the something sun. very large. Yes, uh, yeah, you could either have a star or you could have a galaxy looking swirl, you know. Uh, the, a lot of the beings you know of uh, have a greater consciousness, uh, higher beings you know of have a greater consciousness in that in that uh, realm uh, now eventually this this uh, came down to a separate consciousness and of course these are separate celestials this is this would appear like um, separations from true source but it's not uh, and there goes the parentish uh, celestials and this is the creation of soul DNA is what it's called uh, and now to male and female sons or celestials, or the galaxy looking, uh, and this is gender creation. And so again, that comes from an initial being that's, again, if you think of that initial being now starting to separate, again, perceived separation, starting to separate itself. So you're going from wham, consciousness from source, to now, boom, a separation that's going to start to cause male and female yeah, in this the, expression because this expression part of what was wanted in this expression was a male and female version pretty much of things yes and this and this created a new set of stars and or celestials and from that you have the what is known as the creator council what you've heard us talk about uh, uh, even though further up the ladder, you can say the celestials are oh, technically are, but you have the Creator Council in human-like forms, uh, like um, Jesus is in there, uh, uh, and some of uh, like Michael and some of the others uh, original ones were in there. Even though those are avatars, technically of these original oversoul types or what we call oversouls, uh, this would be then go further down to a separation of soulmates. What you've heard us uh, talking about, you can mention that vision of yours. Go ahead if you want to do that. So in general, I saw this really vivid uh, uh, vision, and I thought it was the whole thing was interesting when it had to do with literally a group of uh, people, again, male and female, that were involved in this. But it was really an interesting thing because um, they – you know, were, were conscious to, you know, consciously together and they kind of formed a bit of a circle in the center of the circle there, you know, was a bright, uh, let's say a, a bright light kind of then started revolving like an, you know, uh, uh, an atom. Uh, and then it was really interesting because once that became, let's say, uh, big enough or in or you know that they then part went on one side part went on the other side and literally i swear it was like pulling it apart like taffy it was like like you know like you see mitosis if you've seen under the pulling apart of that okay and then um and then there was a final separation of what was in the very center it's just like mitosis and and basically uh, and then, then you see um, basically uh, and it, it, each separated little piece turns into a male, female, which is then kind of put back together. Like let's say it was, um, you know, twins that are often born together. They sleep together. They all touch and intertwine with one another. So think of it as something like that. And what I was consistently, I've been told consistently, 
even before we're talking today, we wanted to revalidate that, that um, that that was a true vision of uh, how soulmates are actually created um, as a division of something else that then's kind of split into two. Now, my also my understanding, again, is that just because you have something that originally was one now kind of split into two that that you do have also going on a little of sugar and spice or a little bit of whatever added to each one so they were very unique and very separate as, and then they choose different learning experiences and go on but there is something about them that came from a oneness that will have them you know, try to constantly, let's say, rejoin at times or whatever. Not that they, not rejoin is to become one again, but to come close to share experience or to do something together or, or whatever, or to work out an, an issue that there's always going to be a kind of pull that will get them to come together um, because of their originating, how they originated and that originating bond, I guess. Mm -hmm. And uh, in this creator council area, I know there was another group that also took credit for doing this soulmate thing before I get on further. And we would call them, you know, like Arcturian classification, even though I don't like using that word. Uh, this, uh, they, those, those, particular, uh, those particular beings were in that, that circle. You would see that as in the show Babylon 5, they would call them the first ones they fall under that category. And other species kind of came later after that. Now, in the separation of soulmates, the original thing that took place is one usually stayed above and one below. Um, uh, you know, one kind of over St. Luke saw when one incarnated here. But now, both are, uh, uh, when both are here, cycles complete and changes, major changes are made or anomaly type of, uh, type of upheavals in energy start and so again it's our understanding that there is a buttload of soulmates that are here right now more so than ever more so than ever yeah. more so than ever because of these changes that are you know now occurring that you have a lot more of that present here right now and you know when we talk about when we talked about um our um, understanding, uh, you know, of the ones that were trying to kind of create the expression, you know, we also talked about the Anunnaki. So, you know, the one thing that we're being told is that the lineage of, let's say, Anunnaki, if you follow it up, that m most, if not all, Anunnaki are originating celestials. And that was the one thing that we were um, kind of, you know, to, to get beyond the Anunnaki race. And they can become, re-become celestials. That's where you get the gods of old being the planets. That's how, how that works. So, you know, um, but again, is this the way everything always is? The answer is no. This no. is this expression. We're just trying to only talk about some of our understandings of this expression and how it came into being. So uh, the truth is also what we try to explain before um, and we got that more confirmed that it was in the um, during the uh, effort to put together an expression to actually put together an experience that some of the manipulation you know of these beings was beginning to skew their thoughts and this that and the other which really kind of means that when we talk about the first consciousness, okay, so source of all things, first consciousness, it, you know, instead of, it's almost backwards, instead of thinking the first consciousness is an amoeba, the first consciousness is a celestial, okay, because you, you want to think that we start at lower level life and well, move there our are way some up. That do, there are some people in this expression that do start out as 2D life forms as well. Uh, and and uh, from a break off of those celestials, that's another path. But um, but again, but again, it's originating from one of the celestials. Yes. So I guess my uh, what I'm trying to say is that you know, it, you know, which is why we always refer to things you know from the fall to the lifting because it actually started as something 
pretty magnanimous that you would think was the end result. And actually what you're dealing with is something magnanimous that went a different path to, to within to I'm assuming then have the experience of coming and rising back up the path again. But, and it seems to be a little like that for, um, for this expression. So, and it's, and it would go along with if, you know, uh, you know, many people stressing, if you only knew who you were, if you only really knew who you were, you know, with that forgetfulness and everything like that. So what, where the information we're getting kind of supports all of these different conversations that were had, you know, um, that have been had from many areas and many even bits and pieces of religion that were correct or whatever. But it, but the one thing that, that we wanted to point out is that at this at the same first, let's call it consciousness level of, you know, of a, of a celestial that had a certain, let's call it mindset. I don't even know how to express it of having an experience. Something as equal was being created to also start the polarity, the polarity of things that started to begin where, you know, things went from, you know, um, just an experience to being dark and light. Okay, so there's, again, there's, there's a, as great a force on one side as there is another, and, and I think you have a little bit about how that was done. Yeah, the one thing I do want to add, what I'm being told is in between uh, New Star and Creator Council here, um, there is also between, you know, also between separated soulmates and all that, that's where the 2D life form evolution thing came in. It's oh, right, okay. right in there. Okay. See, this is what the, the this map know, looks, looks like. It looks crazy. I know, it looks crazy. See, this looks crazy right here. Whoa. Yeah, it would have been the animal area or the 2D life form would be somewhere in this. You need this to area. write that down on there somewhere for yourself. Okay. Enough yeah. that he'll never be able to read this again, which is why we're trying to record it. Yes, yeah, so, okay. <laughs> yeah, that, that would be, okay, somewhere in this part, uh, 2, 2D. Uh, hold on just a second. Either left open. Okay. 2D life form app. Uh, two, and then this goes this, this way here in, the, in that area which mm -hmm. I showed you right here. And I know this looks like a convoluted mess right here, but this is how the whole chart looks. And now I'm going to get into the one that uh, my little finger's on right here. And this one, you know, people are probably wondering, okay, what about the Orions? And when they break, broke through from the other expressions and universes. This goes all the way back to the parentish soul DNA area. Darkness, separation, and contrast. And I put Orions created a dark and light universe or dark and light universes to create both separation of self and of polaric ideas. Uh, and this is the, what they use when they do the for and against with people here. Uh, slaves to this idea uh, created the idea of heroes and villains. And uh, here, here is something that, uh, let's see, here we go. Uh, when their original universe collapsed and they wanted to survive, they ripped into other expressions and times, feeding on others' energy and life forces. They feel they were screwed over by creation and feel that they have a right to control. They feel that they must take creation's place. They feel that they were, uh, that they're owed slaves to time and lower density and densities. This, uh, this is actually, they need anchor points. Uh, they, they created a dark and a light universe. You probably heard me mention this on Interstellar Council. And they did this to keep separation of ideas. There would always be an angel to save and always be a demon to oppress. Neither one is really the real idea. And uh, they have the dark universe where they hang out. This, this, it's basically a copy of the one they came from. They created this threat. Now, the ground here, and this goes back to New Star, 
the area of the chart where it says new star, male, female, sun, gender creation, new star. They created a dark galaxy celestial using the energy when they went back in time to this top area here. They used time travel to go back here. Using that creation process, they created a dark galaxy celestial here as an overseer, there, which became their god that they got locked into. Uh, if you saw this thing, it would look like a black hole, uh, basically big abuse of dark matter is what it would look like, a confluence of dark matter. And that's where you got the, uh, got the abuses to dark matter here, which has been pretty much almost dealt with, or pretty much dealt with, and the information's been grounded into the benevolent Earth Day kitchen, the benevolent Black Day kitchens. So they went back further in time to create the dark galaxy overseer within this expression, since it had to be here in this expression, within, uh, so that they could have more of an anchor here to go back to. So they could, they could have something to go back to. They could go to back to their dark universe, but it's easier to go to their now created deity that they put here. This is why it is so very important to refer to creator or prime creator as the true benevolent source creator. This is the main reason why you must use true benevolent source creator because there is a uh, dark galaxy overseer that they created, but yet they answered to as a god. I know that sounds paradoxical, but they had to do it that way because they had it that way in their dark universe. Their whole dark universe was that. They took piece of piece of that to create another dark universe, then here as their dark overseer. And that's where they get their power from. This is where conjurers, conjurers like in the Cabal, dark magicians, cursors, hexers, all of it. This is where they get their power from. Uh, eventually this is going to collapse, of course, into what it's supposed to be. These are all false constructs that have been interrupting the true process here. But also shaping it and changing it because of the contrast even though that's, a, that's a, uh, an overage, there has still been a benefit to this balancing out in the way that it has. You need the contrast here. I'm not saying we wouldn't have dark and light within ourselves anyway. That, uh, the separation of the two is what the farce is. We have it inside anyway. And we need the contrast in our life in order to learn from. The other crap is just overage that was, that was generated. Uh, the, the, so, uh, and even the archontic forces themselves still provided us with basically this the contrast in order to balance. We are the balancers. We're the ones with the codes that can balance all of this because we contain some of their coding too. So we use it, reverse it back and change the rest of creation. Our will to change is changing that whole picture. That's why, why the, the, uh, the three houses fell that time. Uh, now to go back to uh, now, if something is, say, reabsorbed by true benevolent source creator, what happens? Well, that goes back before even the top part here, where they, uh, the, uh, these guys up here. This goes back before an original identity was created. Say you, you want a being to be audited, and they're uh, going back to true benevolent source creator. What happens? melds back into source, and there is another expression that exists out there in the multiverse, uh, not just the multiverse. Multiverse is all basically almost universes similar to our own. You have omniverses and you have super omniverses. Omniversal expression, we can create our own omniversal expression by the, by the codexes we generate, but omniversal expression and super omniversal expressions Super omniversal is where there's a bunch of omniverses collected within. That's like having a carton of eggs with the eggs in them. Each egg is an omniverse. Now there is another verse. You always hear me, true benevolent verses. There is another verse that when something is, is reabsorbed by true benevolent source creator, it goes around through the, one of these verses that's controlled by another overseer, a good one, one of these, one of these original guys right here, that, but in a different expression. 
their version of it. It's like a drain or a filtration system, and eventually, if needed, that beam can come back, but in a more balanced form. Well, and that's probably what you mean instead of, let's say, good at the very top, more of balance. More of a balance. It wouldn't necessarily be just these guys, but it would be for another expression. No, but yeah. these guys in general yeah. are balanced. These guys are balanced. That's, I think, you know, I know we get so used to saying good and bad because we're so used to duality. Yeah, but we're used to duality, but it's balanced. Yeah. Whereas in the other expression, there was great unbalance. Because they, of the divide of, say, hero-villain mentalities, things of that nature. And so they wanted, to, you know, in general, to continue their unbalanced philosophy, which is why they broke over. Mm -hmm. So would we have potentially, in this created expression, would we have had a duality? Would we have had a certain methodology to us growing? There probably would be some similar things going on, but as Chris saying, not the horrendous overage that, you know, had has now occurred because of this other coming through and uh you know um and so this expression ended up basically turning into the lifeblood of somebody else's expression experience mm -hmm. and that's where the wrong was that's where it was crazy yes so one of the things that you know um uh, that maybe we can i don't know if we can tease this out anymore because i have a lot of questions obviously as you probably do um you know that we with that we're teasing this out a little bit more one of the questions would be well then are you saying that it's it's the um the first level of um consciousness uh, in source uh that is in this expression are you basically saying if everyone followed their origins up that you'd find out that every single one of us was a celestial that we originated from that, or are there other, uh, you know, uh, types of beings besides celestials involved in this I expression? Feel, I feel it's that, and also beings from other expressions that incarnated here as well. Yeah, that's that's the you know. So I think those are natural questions. Yeah. I I you know I like to just ask the questions because I don't pretend to know. Are we all stardust? You know, Technically, kind of as a physical being, that is absolutely true. But are we all stars? No. Okay. So, I mean, you know, uh, I think those are kind of natural questions with all this, but it is interesting to try and tease out. Again, I I think it's important to know enough of our genesis, okay, uh, to knowing what happened to help empower people to realize that they are actually a part of, of themselves. Their consciousness is a part of a great, 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 great consciousness and there should be a lot of, you know, empowering with that and then learning how to, since you can't have all the information from that great consciousness currently in your body, how do you learn to, to retrieve information that you need at a moment, so it's like a great library, to pull it into your life to help you with what you want to do and to put the book back really quick so you can pull the next book out. That's kind of how I look at it to gain the um, to gain the experience of what you're doing. Yes, and, and I also want to uh, uh, make clear also say where Jesus is involved uh, and Mary Magdalene, for instance. You got that separated soulmates part, and also the time of Maldek was somewhere around uh, that time as well. Because this, there were at that point, at that point, the beings that were on Maldek were separated as a soulmate to something else. To something else. It was around that time. And Jesus is here, folks. He is in Agartha. Mary Magdalene, I am not too certain, uh, but I know she's outside. It's that above and below uh, type, of, type of thing uh, where Mary Magdalene would, and or say the real name, name of his soulmate. I'm not sure if certain if that's her actual name above. Uh, and then he is technically below. It's just like the old term sub rosa, beneath the rose, that's involved with the Jesus bloodline story, where he went below, she stayed above on the surface and did some things here, took uh, care of, well, I believe, one of their children here in that story. Uh, but at that time, they were both on earth to affect the change. That changed with her. That changed. She went out there. He stayed here. Uh, I know that sounds weird and, and completely disproportionate to what you know about Jesus Christ, 
but that's what took place right there because he ended up getting a sickness, but you all know that part of the story. He had to get help changing his harmonic back and split and had all these, these, these creepy things happen to him. That's part of uh, the story right there. This, is, this goes back to both of these things that took place. This unifies both stories in his story right there. Uh, so when they when these guys here created that virus, it ended up doing that split subdivision vampiric, you know, the need to control and dominate, you know, kind of like a scab that needed to be removed. We we talked about the vampire virus before. So uh, I know uh, we were talking to Jesus. I know I knew there was a reason he hung around. So we'll just go. Uh, we'll make uh, make this a quick channeling here at the end. So we'll probably just go straight into questions then, I would assume, because uh, he's been smiling the whole time. We've been saying that map and doing that thing, so uh, we know, he knows we got the general idea. And, not and I mean general, because, yeah. guys, this is, this is like so. This is what a human right now can comprehend from this. That's all we're saying. This you is... saw that convoluted chart that I showed you this <laughs> Yeah, all over the place. Yeah. And that was the best that he could do to help us get a better idea of how it all worked. Part of this came came through because, you know, we were having strong feelings of family, you know, uh, with some of these beings that we could not even begin to understand. Why were we even having any of these feelings? It didn't make sense. It ended up having more to do with uh, the the uh, first consciousness where there's kind of a parentish more so than anything else after a remembering of way back way 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 back um, where you know some of these beings as their larger consciousness that you had a familiarity with them you know being a as new star a, yourself yeah as a star and you also had a familiarity with them as say the avatar of that star. True, yeah. true. But I mean, potentially both. But I mean, it didn't make uh, uh, some of it is like, why are we? Why are we even having these feelings? So um, actually, what happened is, for some reason, Jesus felt we were at a point we could have it. So he's here. Okay. Now let's see. I got to make this brief because the battery's going down on mm -hmm. this. So kept uh, <laughs> keep your eye on that. So mm -hmm. let's see. Uh, okay, Jesus. Uh, through the crystal, yeah, yeah, yeah. Briefly, I will say that what has been explained here is the crux of what human comprehension level is. This is the conversation that needed to be had amongst all the, let's just say, frailties of the day including the avatars of beings like myself, which who are also susceptible to being worshipped or being considered higher than everyone else. As what is purported to say for me in the Bible, greater than I will, greater than I will come. Sorry, there are interruptions in this because they do not like communication. Also, human thought forms disrupt my true channeling. So I must be brief. I will state that worship thought forms do do damage. As was said in a previous recording. And that People claiming to channel myself aren't always as knowledgeable in that area, not to judge, but the idea of what people think of myself is not always true. Some things were mixed, but they did not need to be mixed. I will do brief questions. So, uh, you know, I found it was very interesting that you feel that we're at a place right now that even this conversation adding to our generalized understanding before actually could be had. I'm 
I'm curious, do you, can you explain why this new information, why right now was a good time for it? Is because of this energy changeover and all of that was hidden is being revealed. All that does not need to be is also being revealed so people will know what to discard. The reason it is coming out now is because of that reason. It is your own histories, it is your own soul path, and the histories you've had amongst other beings of the stars, and the fact that some of you may have come from stars. This is all coming out in a timely fashion. You always say in divine timing, and yes, does true benevolent source creator have perfect timing? Yes, but there is more than one creator, you see, as was explained. This is why I was smiling when this was said, because it showed the path not only within your expression, but others. All of this information is coming out, is coming out through various means. There are other humans out there that, that either believe they understand this and only understand a small portion of it, or they believe that they you shouldn't understand this. And this is what is going on right now with some of your disclosure. Aside from all the other stuff you know about COVID and all of the other things going on right now. In this, I can honestly say that the more this information is grounded as of right now into the true benevolent earthly Akesh and the true benevolent galactic Akeshes, the more you will have the inspiration to understand and create based on that template of information and not the false illusion uh, or template or foundation that you have been standing on thus far. You were standing on nothing, like what was said by the dear Mer people. You were standing on nothing. Now you're standing on something real. This is the real, but this is also one facet of reality. This is what you can comprehend currently. Even the biggest mathematician out there or scientist would still try to go through this logically, which is fine, but also to feel it out. You have felt it out to the, I don't want to say the pinnacle of where you can, but your comprehension level at this time, including some of the galactic avatars that are out there this time. Your people get into space, you will see they are just like you trying to figure out these very same things. The beings you mentioned before in the Creator Council, along with some of, uh, along with myself and some others. Yes, do we have a little bit more understanding? But it doesn't mean we have all that we had before as those celestials you see. Yes, is all time one? And is your higher self here always with you? Absolutely. It is all one. But what can you bring into this expression? What information from that library can you truly access within the parameters of this expression? That is the true question right there. Can you bring through all of it in some creative fashion? Yes, you can. Can you ground it here? Yes, you can in the pinnacle of creativity, passion, and all of that. Of course, and unity, of course. Can it constantly last? No, but can you be in that higher vibration all the time? Yes, that is what you're working towards. But can the entirety of that original template come through in a template that has changed over the course of time? No. So my, my question is, I think this will be a logical question, and we're, gonna, we're just going to have to ask about you specifically, because I think this question would be a natural one to come through. Uh, why why do you feel Agartha is the right place for you right now? What, is it because you can't get out to another planet or you're choosing to be here? I'm just curious. I think it's a natural question. Here is the best place for certain types of shielding, certain stones, certain minerals, uh, shield against particular thought forms. This is why you build devices that have certain minerals and different elements within them. Nature magic, you would call it. This is why paganism is so, as you would say, hot right now, because the elemental magic 
is what is needed to do certain shielding and certain shielding magic. Uh, against also against what you previously spoke about karma dumping. This is this is another way to shield. This is why I shield because of the thought forms aimed at myself. As you said in the previous recording, uh, the biggest karma dump of all time. And yes, you would perceive it as such in my with my own history. So Agartha is a logical choice. Not only is there flowing water beneath that has certain minerals and certain energies but there are minerals above that also shield on all sides, depending on where you go in Agartha. In some areas, it may vent to the surface and may not provide as much shielding. In other areas, it's, the shielding is nearly absolute, and that is where I am located. So I find that interesting because you're, what you're also stating is how special this planet, planet is. Yes. It's way more special than we may even recognize as far as what's on it. Uh, and uh, the different things that people can do within this planet. We know there's a lot of harvesting of um, natural resources from this planet, but I, 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 I actually wouldn't have thought of that being your answer. So um, I find that very, very interesting. So I know you have limited time. I, I understand that. I, I, I actually don't even know where to begin with questions. So I just want to leave this up to you for what would you really like to get across right now with this opportunity to everyone? Not only is the structure of the what you brought across accurate to within your perception and where you are in your reality, but I also wish to say that forcing other perceptions onto people based in a particular grounding such as worship or karma dumping. I am also commenting on the previous video since I was not able to do so before. You could put these one after another or both together. I do not care. It is actually more harmful than you believe. You must not push that onto others. It causes great imbalance within the self and can come back and reciprocate upon the self. And that type of harm you call curses and hexes can reciprocate back upon you and reverb and reverb again and again and again. These energy waves like ripples in a pond. What I am trying to say is when you send that worship energy, it actually disrupts you not only from grounding, but from seeing this cycle that we have spoken about. It disrupts you from seeing your true origins if you are constantly placing that energy in another or dumping karma on another or cursing or hexing another. It is actually taking away power from yourself. You may believe that you are empowering, but you are disempowering. It is preventing you from seeing you. You must see you to ground, to empower, to become uh, creativity, to become your passion and live within that. Whatever that is, whatever that piece of you that is you, become that. Yes, defend yourself with magics. Use magics to shield like I am. But do not give power away to what you would perceive to be a god. Do not give power away by cursing and hexing, even though it would take them noticing in order to bounce it back at you. It is still not a healthy thing to do. Defend with those magics, defend your home self, all of that with uh, what you call sorcerer traps to trap thought forms, all of those things. But do not become offensive in that way. Think of the word offensive to offend. That is to offend the self. You're offending the self, the celestial, or wherever it is that you came from. It is offensive, you see. So remember that. This is where I must part ways because the conduit is not stable today. So thank you all. All right. So, uh, thank you, Jesus. Uh, I could see where he was at too. He was in, I could briefly see where he was in a little carved out stone room with a door open going. <laughs> so it was like that, just sitting uh, on a, on a, like it looked like a bed. 
Mm-hmm. We would see it as almost like a hospital room or like an apartment kind of. That's how we would perceive it. You know, it's like a little hospital, room. kind of like also in biblical times where they had the little carved out little some of the stuff like with the structure. Some of them were stones, some of them were, of course were wood, but you know, the little stone structures of some people carved out. That's what it looked like. And uh, they've shown it on, on shows with the stalactites, stalagmites, and I heard water running nearby. So like there's like a stream or a brook or something running close to his location. And uh, I would have never expected him to say this was the safest place for him. Yes, I would never expect <laughs> that. Well, this is the nexus point, so you get traffic both ways. So this is actually, it's logical when you think about it with all the stones and minerals that you don't find anywhere else in, cre- uh, in creation, except maybe you find quartz and things of that nature, but things like amethyst are only here. There's different dimensional layers that merge, merge in different timelines. So you get these different magical components and magical uh, uh, alchemies and elixirs and, and combinations that show up here that you don't see anywhere else. That's why Earth is so coveted by a lot of these different races, harvester races, or ones that want to trade here. That's why it's so, that makes sense if you think of it on those lines. When some of the resources they want here, they want mining rights here. Why? Because they're, they're, they can't find it anywhere else. And it's valuable to them and they can't replicate it. And so it would make sense that he is here, not that you think of it on those terms. Mm-hmm. So I think uh, we're we're good with this discussion with uh, uh, me and Joanna. Uh, so uh, thank you everybody for watching this. This was actually a very enlightening download that we got after clearing the other mess that we had before and the previous uh, uh, recording of this where it was about karma dumping. So when you see these recordings, they'll be about a week apart. Uh, the karma dumping and the uh, and this one whatever I choose to name it between now and then. And they were both done? They're done the same day. Same day. As you can see, she's wearing the same shirt right here. So am I. Yeah. Hooray. <laughs> so, uh, uh, so yeah. And I'm wearing the same thing. So people are saying, hey, wait a minute. They're wearing the same thing. We record the same day. A lot of film places. A lot of studios honest, do this. We, we so. wash and wear the same thing. All the time too. Yeah. Well, so you really couldn't tell the difference <laughs> anyway. So, uh, uh, be honest. We're not fashionistas. No, we're not. Uh, no, we're not. Uh, somebody once told me I had to come up with a style. Well, this is it. The boom style right here. So uh, this is it, folks. Uh, you're not going to see me dressing up in a costume doing the whole Cagliostro thing. No, uh-uh, no. So that's not happening. So uh, even though I like uh, the whole sci-fi dress up just like the next person or cosplay, it won't be because I'm doing my work. So, no. Uh, okay, thank you, everybody. Bye-bye. One point I did not mention was there was a part in the Elder Scrolls in Skyrim where you find out more about the dwarves uncreating themselves. And uh, about how, and this was mentioned in other other, uh, other uh, Elder Scrolls videos, but I'll, I'll recap a little. I'm, I'm not, I, I don't remember all the history, but I just know that they got to a certain level and they wanted to uh, uncreate uh, themselves thinking that they would find uh, Kim, essentially, or they would find that that eternal state merging back with all of creation. You find that the elves want to uncreate themselves as well. The the uh, ultimate dominion, those uh, those that uh, uh, want to become nothingness. And the, there's also some beings uh, that uh, run casinos and take blood samples from people that want to become the essence of addiction. That's just slightly different. But then. Uh, basically uh, suffering what I call final death. Whereas you blend back with source creator, you're supposed to keep your identity intact. It's also the elves in it, the, the, uh, or the Thalmor in it, that are outlawing the worship of Talos. They, don't, they believe he's the embodiment of Lorcan, and the trickster dreamer. And uh, they don't want any part of it. They want to create their own dream. Also, they, they see they see Talos as not something that should be worshipped or venerated in any way, shape, or form. Uh, they don't they don't they see uh, they see there's supposed to be nine divines and they go by the eight. Essentially, you hear people go by the eight or by the nine, you know, depending on what side of the civil war they they, they fall on. And uh, with the elves, though, yeah, they that's why they severely outlawed it. This is why they end up creating the white gold concordant with uh, the empire. They outlaw the they ban the worship of Talos. And uh, this also caused, you know, when they when they programmed Ulfric Stormcloak, 
if you look in the Thalmor dossier in the uh, embassy uh, on Ulfric Stormcloak, you see he was abducted, programmed to put back, and this is why he uh, murdered the High King, the uh, High King Torig. So uh, uh, essentially that program was in very much like a sleeper agent or a Manchurian candidate to keep a civil war going for 20 years. Uh, or at least I believe it's 15, 20 years in the game war. But what I'm getting at is they were, they were causing that level of distraction to dominate. But at the same time, it's confusing because the Orions don't necessarily want to uncreate themselves. They want to recreate uh, themselves. And the view of that you must find emptiness and empty yourself out, that's more of a vampiric concept. Uh, so that's contradictory to what actually is. You have to become your fully self here, accessing that library and mantle. I love that word now. Mantling the oversoul with, with the your I am presence here. And essentially, I've always said oh, the I am presence is the, the soul itself. That's just more you hear. That's why I always say you summon someone's I am presence uh, in your prayers. Uh, essentially uh, what we say is the bad effects of good intentions that can drain the person. That's because you're in the human form. You're summoning that person's name, their seal, their signet. But at the same time, if somebody were to call on a torrent call, uh, I, I feel there would still be a draining because that mantling is taking place for me here. So uh, it's basically because uh, we've chosen a different name here. Just like Viking doesn't go by Hugo Oest. He goes by the Viking. So I go by uh, Christopher Jacobs, or sometimes I use the writer name, of course, Christopher Stephen Jacobs, the whole thing. I've never wanted to change it. Never had the compulsion to change it. I've never uh, never uh, had the urge of using Torrent Kahl's name either, just in more of a historical sense. So uh, I find this very interesting. They've, they've added this in, into the, the uh, game, most also in a more logical sense, where, they, where the dwarves use technology, such as soul crystals and their their intellectual know-how to reach that, that which I, I don't believe it can be except through technological means in that way like the uh, Nazis did for traveling the multiverse in uh, Man in the High Castle. They used technology, then you had the people uh, using the spiritual know-how uh, to uh, shift or travel from universe to universe, as long as they didn't have a duplicate in any universe. Uh, very, very, very fascinating uh, uh, Showing of both means, but uh, that's also could be an attachment more to the uh, transhumanistic. But uh, you can, through scientific means, create a portal and go to the multiverse. The dwarves created their constructs and, and basically created this know how oh, we want to become this, we want to be we uncreate ourselves or fused with everything, uncreate our own individual identities. That's the popular belief behind like ascension, popular belief behind awakening. That you're all one, which is still true. You're, everything is one in creation. doesn't mean you lose your individual self or identity. That's asinine. That's just a, that's more of a harvest uh, concept. And also that leads me to the word harvest that's been coupled with more ascending or transmuting and transconfiguring. That's that church bullshit. Uh, and uh, that's the Law of One uh, book series, bullshit with the Rod Group uh, uh, and the Corey Good material. That's... No. Uh, harvest means exactly that. You're harvesting crops. That's the soul trade. That's the loose trade. That's the soul shard trade, like what was depicted in Jupiter Ascending uh, with the, uh, with the uh, Orion family wanting to rejuvenate themselves with people's soul shards and uh, all that. No. Mm -mm. That's that vampiric shit. No, you don't want that. that uh, but this... Uh, this is uh, it's different where you have to ground yourself here and bring in more of this, more of those codes to be able to improve the, your oversoul. It's in reverse. You're bringing in the wisdom. You're getting dis you're basically fusing both sides together, the best of both parts. So you're not two. You are one. Uh, so uh, I, I hope this actually clarified that. I will end this here. I will not continue to babble because some people have complained about that a little bit. Just know when I get these downloads, this is how it goes, folks. So it is 1.04 p.m. Thursday, June 16th, 2022. Thank you. One other angle to this, sorry, folks. One other angle to this is also the whole thing with the monomyth in it, where all these beings that created 
the whole game that's here got enthralled with their own game very much like some of these galactic forms uh beings like michael beings like uh uh Torin uh um and you know, a lot some of these beings that got enthralled with the whole orion agenda down here when everything started happening and uh and they allowed for them to break into the system. They got uh, the Ryans break into the system. They got enthralled in their own creation, just like in the Enlightenment Zero, where Talawanda uh, basically said he was in his own pocket and that his wife was still in the game. He got enthralled in the game, but he didn't want to get involved with the whole illusion. This is kind of the whole concept where they get stuck in the illusion. And there's other, there's, other members of like different soul groups that can't always see members of their their group that have gotten so enthralled that the codes have kind of other codes have kind of shielded them from the sight of their own soul families. That can happen. Uh, other thing of it is like uh, I will say briefly, uh, there is a uh, little baby that I met where I am going to have to give a doll to this little child. That this little child is. Uh, member of this group, this elven group that speaks through, you know, knitted dolls and toys and stuff, so that children are more comforted in situations uh, like uh, uh, one that I uh, that I spoke about in our portals and doorways and and uh, hidden rooms episode of the lifting, uh, where uh, where it was about a little girl that went into a different dimension through a closet, had to get away from an Orion like nun like figure. And went into uh, this closet to be, this portal to be with these elves that were there and other beings. Like in a Renaissance village, this is where you get the, uh, the, the uh, witch, the lion, and, uh, war, uh, the, 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 basically the uh, lion, the witch, and the wardrobe uh, concept from. Uh, where negative beings can use those uh, wardrobes as portals as well, like, like with closets. Uh, the point of me bringing this up is uh, this little child is a member of that society that was lost to them. They wanted to, uh, me to bring a doll to them to be able to him to be able to uh, connect with him again uh, in that way. Uh, they wanted a specifically knitted doll so uh, that uh, they would speak through. And we do have an after show on this. Uh, that will be on our subscription once that is that is up. And I'm hoping by the time you all see this, there is something available. If not, it will be. So uh, just know these beings did get stuck in their own game, and then sometimes those codes made it impossible to, for them to see. This is why you have some of these beings go, oh, we found you. Sometimes that's a negative uh, thing where I saw a nymph show up at somebody's house and go, oh, I found you. That was, in, that was slightly different. Uh, that was more of a... A sexual energy siphoning that was a negative nymph or Syrian type being uh, like this naked purple nymph that showed up and wanted to uh, wanted to seduce this person that was different but then there's a soul family where there's nothing but joy that they found who this person was and where they've been all along so I will leave it there it is it's up to your discernment which is which it is 109 p.m. Thursday June 16th 2022 thank you Okay, another point that I'd like to make is the uh, show Moon Knight. Also, it would have to do with uh, with different avatars, different beings, like when another being contracts with another one uh, to accomplish a goal down here. One that is not necessarily their oversoul, but their oversoul can be that way. I'm not going to go into the, the details because I've already said it. For our subscription material, if the subscription is out by the time you see this video, just uh, go subscribe with uh, it's, it would be within uh, the uh, the liftings uh, website at the time. But just know that if you're seeing the old website, uh, that's not the subscription. So if people go to the lifting.net and just see the old website. That's not the subscription, so uh, you don't have to uh, send us a barrage of questions saying, well, where do I subscribe? That means it's not there yet. So uh, if you see this video and the subscription is already out, it will be the lifting.net. Again, the, the, uh, the Moon Knight material is, is uh, very good at the avatar um, concept uh, as far as different beings go. Very well, uh, 
well put together. That was on Disney Plus, Marvel Cinematic Universe, uh, uh, their character of Moon Knight. So uh, it worked out quite well and has to do with this topic. So it is 2.05 p.m. Thursday, June 16th, 2022. Thank you. If you want to get an idea of what the void can do, it's more like uh, one of those things that affects you. It care, it sometimes it affects you permanently or in some area where a wound never heals somewhere. Usually mental. But it's more like in the end of the third Lord of the Rings where he said the wound was still there from the Nodsgul blade. And, um, Nodsgul blade. And it never left. And then the only thing that fixed it was him dimensionally traveling with the elves. And the same went with um, with uh, Bilbo, where when he rid himself of the ring, he aged very rapidly, but he still carried that pain with him. And it's the same difference. This is the same difference. Uh, the exact same type of situation, where just uh, getting it resolved was going on to spirit or going into another dimension where it couldn't exist, uh, or another frequency where it couldn't exist. And it's usually mental, but it, uh, it uh, when you look at it, it looks back at you and changes you. It's kind of like the same thing he was stabbed. It's the same thing on a mental level, or on a spirit level. It changes you. So, like where he's saying right up to the end when he finishes his book, uh, it, uh, it still hurts. The same with the, the ring. I think of the, the void dimension as the ring where people think they can use it for good. And uh, anything like that would be temporary. It still would get the attention of, say, the Eye of Sauron. So, uh, ironically said, because we call the binary network that and the uh, AI that and the military targeting that. But at the same on the same note, it's dimensional as well. And... Uh, uh, um, even if you cover your tracks, it still affects you in some fashion that you carry with you for a while. So, um, either anger or hatred or depression or something. And that's also what, it's intricately woven into Earth, and it's affected Earth in a lot of different ways. Even though it can affect permanent change, it's still a Rubik's Cube that cannot be solved, unless it's within the self. So, uh, uh correcting things in the self, like what Ryan and I were talking about. He said that's the only thing, way that that connection can be solved. And it's not a connection to you, it's just cha you changing the energies within the self and then the outward area. Outward surrounding. Millimeters and centimeters, as it were, in shadow work. So, I'll leave it here. It is 8.38 a.m. Monday, June 20th, 2022. Thank you.